Oh, wow. Alrighty, folks. Yep, that's right. I screwed up. I just did 26 minutes of Aftershock without going live, guys. <laughs> I didn't click the go live button. I went to go look at comments over here after the, uh, the opening monologue for the Aftershock, and I couldn't find the comments because I couldn't find the show because I never clicked go live. Yeah. Rocket scientist right here. All righty Well, now that we're 26 minutes in, I was wondering when my phone was buzzing over here. I'm like, I can't do it right now. I'm, I'm live. I can't stop and look at my phone, right? Oh, great. So we'll give everyone a couple seconds to get connected um, while Thor apologizes profusely for being such an epic screw-up. Hey! All right, so let's do this all again. I did it 26 minutes ago, so I've kind of done it once. I've got... I've got the kinks out now, so I think you're going to get a much more refined product this time around. All right, so in the amount of time that I screwed up, uh, Bitcoin actually rallied another $1,000, guys. Woohoo! See, I was just stalling for it. $45,000 Bitcoin. Um, so what's going on? We got Bitcoin, we got Ethereum. Um, Ethereum is actually outperforming Bitcoin here recently. Um, and the reason for that is the uh, Ethereum is finally moving toward Ethereum 2.0. Uh, what does that mean? All right, so Bitcoin and Ethereum right now are both proof of work, okay? So that means you solve a mathematical problem, you, you re basically confirm a transaction on the network, I show you the mathematical result of my work on the blockchain, everybody else agrees that that mathematical result is correct by doing their own mathematical results and arriving at the same answer, Therefore, it's confirmed after so many confirmations on the, on the network, and boom, I get awarded a juice box and a little bit of Bitcoin. Okay? Yay, me! Um, Ethereum works the same way, where you mine, you do work with graphics cards and other computational equipment, and then you're rewarded with Ethereum. But Ethereum wants to move away from mining, and they want to move toward what are, what's called staking or proof of stake. So rather than giving everybody a little bit of Ethereum every time they confirm a transaction, they want to have you put your Ethereum at risk saying, I'm going to confirm transactions and if I screw up or do something wrong or I'm not honest, you can take my Ethereum. The, the logic here is, is there's no amount of cheating you could possibly do because to stake on the Ethereum blockchain, you have to have at today's prices like $87,000 of Ethereum. So it's like you, you, there's no amount of cheating you're going to do to get one or two or five Ethereum that's gonna, <laughs> that is going to you know, justify $87,000 of risk. That's the idea. So we're moving away from this proof of work going toward a proof of stake instead. They put the first piece of that in place, which basically means the network is moving for sure away from the proof of work mining. There's a lot of people in the green environment or the green movement that are concerned with the environmental costs of proof of work. You know, Elon famously saying that Bitcoin mining is unsustainable, um, whereas it's kind of hilarious because there is more energy used in the modern banking system than all of Bitcoin put together. But that's a story for another time. Uh, so anyway, uh, staking. So how what happens? A lot of people don't realize how Ethereum works. They understand that Bitcoin is like a gold coin, right? And I can trade that coin to somebody else for goods or services. They take the Bitcoin, they give me goods and services. It works a lot like cash, okay? Ethereum is different. Ethereum can be used to power applications, like programs, or purchase computational services. So I, let's say I run a cloud computing company, you give me Ethereum, I give you cloud computing and you use the cloud computing in your applications and it's all documented on the blockchain and you use the blockchain for various parts of your application. It, it's very complicated, but it consumes the Ethereum, right? So it, it's being destroyed, which is deflationary. Just like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is deflationary. There's only so many Bitcoins that are ever going to be created. No more, no less. If they wanted to make more Bitcoin, they'd have to get everybody who currently holds Bitcoin to agree to create more Bitcoin. Why on earth would they do that? Why would you debase your current investment by issuing more of it that you don't own? That's stupid. So, of course, that's not going to happen. Now, with Ethereum, they plan when you stake that money, right, you're putting your $87,000 in chips across the table to get a return. 
They're paying you interest, basically, because while your Ethereum is staked, it's not accessible. You can't spend it. You can't pull it back. It's staked for a period of time, almost like a, like a money market account almost. And you're paid interest back. So you get the interest back for staking it, and the interest is paid in Ethereum. That's how they're replacing the Ethereum that's being destroyed in the network instead of mining it. So that's a quick explanation of proof of stake versus proof of work. But Ethereum made the first move to ETH 2.0 successfully on the blockchain this week, which is why their price rocketed. Bitcoin went up too, but Ethereum went up a lot. Uh, Ethereum right now is at $3,131.49, so $3,100. The all-time high is $4,100. Bitcoin is at $45,000. The all-time high is like sixty. dollars so, percentage-wise, pretty close, but the move in the last week on Ethereum has been massive, especially considering that a $1,000 move on a $2,000 asset is way more powerful than a $5,000 move on a $35,000 asset. So, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal, the amount of improvement. If you have Ethereum, you made a lot of money this week. Um, one of the things we talked about during the radio show was that China is kneecapping their tech industry. And one of the ways that they're doing this, they started with Bitcoin. They can't have a competitor for the digital yuan that's freedom-based because if whenever you take something that's centrally controlled and has all the negatives that come with something that's centrally controlled and can be expired by the government and everything else, and then you have an option over here that's free of control of any type, which one would you choose? Well, you're going to choose the one that's free of control of any type. You're going to probably have a little digital you want, but they're not going to have the corner on the market. It's going to be a blend, right? You can't have that. So they're getting rid of, they're going to kneecap the entire Bitcoin industry because they're like, hey, we control half of the Bitcoin industry here in China. Um, if we kneecap it, we can destroy, we can take this thing out, right? Well, when they banned mining in China, 60% of the mining capability of the Bitcoin network went offline. This is why, and I'm, I'm not going to sit here, I'm not tooting my horn, don't, please don't misunderstand, but this is why I said what I said like three or four weeks ago, that the Bitcoin uh, mining, the, the, the mining power of the network has dropped by 60%. That's going to cause the price of Bitcoin to come down because it, you know, basically it's seen as a, by the algorithms and traders as a lowering of the interest in mining Bitcoin. Therefore, if less people are mining Bitcoin, less people are interested in Bitcoin, the Bitcoin price should come down. So it did. And I said, about three, four weeks from now, these, these miners are going to be bought and sold all over the place. I bought two right before this big rally. Like, I, thank God I got two of them bought. Otherwise, I'd be back up again in the stratosphere in price. But I basically bought at the bottom on my mining equipment, too. I should have bought more. I wish I would have. But anyway, um, now what's going to happen, that we're looking at a 6% difficulty increase in the next four days when, it, when difficulty adjusts again on Bitcoin. Every two weeks it adjusts. Last, the, the last adjustment two weeks ago, 10 days ago, whatever, it went up like 2%. It, was, it had turned positive for the first time. Now it's 6%. The next one's going to be like 13% as these mining... People who got out in China and just sold their equipment, that equipment is finding its place to Bitcoin-friendly countries right now. Just like I bought two miners from China this week. They're going to send them to the United States and they're going to go into my mine and they're going to start mining Bitcoin. The, the equipment is not going away. Maybe you can't mine it in China, but there are other countries in the world. And Kazakhstan really likes mining. <laughs> Kazakhstan, they like mining. The, all the former Soviet bloc countries, they like mining. Um, El Salvador wants, it literally made Bitcoin a state currency. I mean, they like mining. This, this equipment is finding places that are friendly, that have reasonably cheap power costs, and they're being used there. There's a guy in China who had to shut down his Bitcoin mine. Now, my Bitcoin mine, inside the mine, when it's operating, let's, let's say the outside temperature is 70 degrees. The, the, the temperature in the mine is 30 degrees hotter than outside air. So if it's 100 degrees, it's 130 in the mine. It's hot, okay? I'm burning 400 amps of power on a continuous basis to mine Bitcoin, give or take, depending on what machines are up or down. And I'm earning a, like, half of a, I'm trying to think of a good way to describe this, basically a 
one. Uh, that's not right. Basically, I'm earning like $200 of Bitcoin a day, okay, in, in current pricing. So it's not a lot of Bitcoin, tiny amounts of Bitcoin every day that are added to my wallet every day. That then I send to BlockFi and I earn interest on and I try to compound all that, right? This dude in China had a Bitcoin mine that was mining 30 Bitcoins a day. Between 30 and 80 Bitcoins a day. A day. 30 times, let's get the current price, $45,000 a day. And China crushed that. Just like that. Crushed it. So now that equipment's left China. It's moving to places that are friendly toward it. And now because that equipment's coming back online, watch the price go back up. I told you this was going to happen. The price is going to go back up when the Bitcoin, when the mining equipment starts to come back online. Now, how high will the rally go? Industry experts, for whatever they're worth, believe it's going to go around to the to the 50,000, 51, 52,000 before it meets heavy resistance. Uh, to, then it could get pushed back into the 40,000s again after that. Um, the bears think it could drop down back into the 30,000s again. So right now, everything is positive. Everything is moving in the up direction for Bitcoin. It's going to go up from here, I believe. Uh, it's going to get close to 50, if not 50 to 52,000 before it kind of stalls out again for a while, which is dangerously close to the all-time high. This is what Bitcoin does all the time. It rockets up. It has like a 30 to 70% correction that scares the pants off anyone who's a real investor, like stocks, bonds, things like that. They're like, sweet mother of Jesus, what just happened to my money? And then we're like, hold on, just don't sell. And then all the weak hands get shaken out and they sell on the way down. Don't sell, don't sell, just hold. Hold the line. And then all of a sudden, boom, it explodes higher again. Higher than it did the first time. These cycles can take years. One of them took two years to happen, to get to 60,000 from 20. But it went from 20 to 60,000 in two years. Show me your stock that did that. Tesla didn't do that. You know, what, what stock went through a pandemic after losing 60% of its network strength is up, you know, hundreds of hundreds of percent. It, it just doesn't happen. So anyway, um, so that's why Ethereum is going up right now. That's why Bitcoin is going up right now. So I'm going to jump in and see if anybody's got any questions about anything. Sorry again about the late start on the Aftershock, guys. I literally went 26 minutes talking to myself. Um, and now because I went 26 minutes the first time, I was able to refine those thoughts down so precisely, it only consumed 13 minutes of time. Look at that. Maybe I should practice the aftershock before I do it every week, right? Oh, sorry, sorry guys, sorry guys. You need a flashing red light showing you live. You know, it'd be nice. There's a, it says end live video down here, but the problem is the feed looks the same. There's a feed and I can see myself talking on the screen and I hadn't refreshed over here. Well, I thought I did, I, I brought up I went and clicked on the most recent video, and so on this screen over here, my face was moving, and there's like a 15 to 30 second delay, right? So that when I'm making hand gestures, I don't always see them right away, so I'm used to things being time separated. So now I'm looking over here at the screen, and like what I'm talking about now is not what I'm seeing. And then I went to go check comments, and I realized that these are Aaron's comments from the radio show. This is not the right page. I opened the wrong video. I'm a dummy. Let me fix that. And I went back and looked, and I'm like, where is the live video? What the heck? And then, oh, man. <laughs> but one of the things that I did talk about a little bit more in depth was uh, China kneecapping the tech industry when I was doing my practice video. And one of the things that is amazing to me, China was finally reaching a point where they didn't have to steal from other people to innovate. They had an industry that was developing their own technological innovations. They were creating their own software. They're creating their own cell phone infrastructure ecosystem. So they don't have to do Google. They don't have to do Apple. They'd have their own China state controlled operating system for their phones. All these things were happening. And China comes down like a ton of bricks on them. 
It's too much power. They can't have a company with that much power. This is the ultimate failing of the collectivist system. This is why communism doesn't work. This is why China was able to get so far, is because it was communism with capitalist undertones. So we don't mind if you make a little money. You can have more money than the, the people next to you, but if you become a threat to the Politburo because you're so wealthy or your company is so powerful, um, that we cannot tolerate. That has to be controlled and monitored. And you, therefore, have to be controlled and monitored, Jack Ma. China's not stupid. They're watching what's happening with the tech industry in America. They're seeing that the government, it's not, in some cases, it's not in the government's interest if you're a Democrat to really regulate big tech because you like what they're doing. Maybe you want them to do it more, so you're going to threaten to regulate them to get some more activity that you like. If you're on the other side of the spectrum, you want to run them out of business because they're silencing your voice, you think. Um, China wants to control the dialogue. They want to have, they want to have the exact same tech and the exact same abilities. They just want it to be controlled by the Politburo and not by the independent companies. Because what's to stop an independent company like a parlor from coming up? that has all their own infrastructure, all their own servers, all their own capabilities, they're not reliant on anyone. What is more American than something like that happening? That's what Amazon did. Amazon didn't, didn't like buy their infrastructure from other people. In the beginning they did. But then as their need for infrastructure began to cost them so much money, they said, can't we do this cheaper if we do it in-house? So they started doing their own servers and their own stuff. And then they realized that when you buy a server, you buy a bunch of servers, you have a lot of excess processing capacity that you don't need. So they said, well, can we sell some of this excess capacity? And that's how Google's cloud, or uh, Amazon's cloud services started, AWS Cloud. And then they realized they were going to make a lot of money selling the, the access to their computing capabilities. So they bought even more servers and more servers and more servers and more infrastructure and more APIs and more staff. Now Amazon makes more profit selling cloud services than they do selling anything else that they sell. That's, that's how Amazon got to be, got to the place where they could shut Parler down like they did. Because Parler was completely reliant on Amazon's cloud. Well, people are starting to figure out that when you're reliant on something, that means it can be taken away from you. So maybe not, maybe being resilient and independently able to, you know, manage your own infrastructure is a good thing is a resiliency thing. That's an individualistic thing. I mean, some people say it's a prepper thing, right? But, you know, being able to, to grow some food, if you're a farmer, hey, you're growing food all the time. Being able to fix your own equipment, be, you know, being able to turn the wrenches and, and have the spare parts you need on hand to do that kind of stuff so that you can continue to operate in the event of a supply chain interruption. It's estimated that 60% of Americans right now are, they don't, they don't consider themselves preppers, but they are preparing for another disruption, even if they're not aware of it. They buy a little bit more groceries than they used to buy. They buy, they buy a little more deodorant and toothpaste and things like that because they're worried the price is going to go up. They're, they're not preppers. They're not prepping because they believe the world is going to end in some calamity or something. But we're starting to remember that just-in-time inventory is not always on time. That one disruption in that chain anywhere. One link breaks and the whole chain is useless. And we're seeing that in computers now, in chips, in cars, in trucks, and all kinds of things that before were motherboards for freezers. You didn't think, gee, I wonder if my freezer breaks if I can get a new circuit board for it. You never thought about that. They were always available. Of course you can get another circuit board for it. But now you, you genuinely can't. Genuinely you can't. They're just not available right? So what Bitcoin is doing and what the tech industry is doing with Google inventing time crystals and Bitcoin changing modern finance, you, you want to see a great reset. You're watching it happen right now. So one of the things I explained in my practice session <laughs> was that my wife and I wanted to set money aside for a Disney vacation. We're going to take the whole family with us, right? This is before Brian had his heart attack and everything else. We wanted to do the whole family to Disney. We we're going to wait till the mask thing cooled off and everything kind of got back to normal. You know, wait, wait for the normal Disney experience rather than, you know, mask up, temp check, all that garbage. Nobody wants to do that in Florida in like 80 degree heat. But we had this money and we wanted to set it aside. So we could put it in a savings account. 
and we would earn like 0.005% interest or some ridiculously small amount. We could put it in a money market. We could get like 0 0.7 or 0.075%. No, wait, no, sorry. <laughs> 0, 0, 0.075. So yes, seven and a half tenths of a percent. Something like, it's it's ridiculous. Or we could take the money, and I could put I could change it into USDC, a stable coin, a crypto, and deposit it at BlockFi, where it earns 7.9 percent interest compounded monthly. Last month I earned 62 dollars on that deposit. You can do the math and figure out how much a Disney vacation costs for five people, seven people. Um, the bottom line though is, when people start to figure out that you can use crypto to make money relatively risk-free, why would you stay in the dollar? That's what the US government is worried about. That's why stable coins need to be regulated, you see, because it's a threat to the dollar. I look at it a different way. I think crypto is what's gonna save the dollar. Competition of ideas in a free marketplace. What are they going to have to do to the dollar to make it competitive with crypto? Maybe they could back it with crypto. Right? That would be something, wouldn't it? They buy a bunch of crypto and they say that the dollar is backed by cryptocurrency now. Uh, there's some time. There's a long time to go before something like that happens. But what we're going to see is the natural progression of free people choosing to hold an asset that appreciates in value or at least doesn't depreciate in value given inflation. And when you take inflation away from the central bank, you don't have a central bank anymore. Why do you need them? This is a revolutionary change in money. And it's something that we're going to see in our lifetimes. It's nothing that's going to happen next year or the next five years or the next decade. This is going to be a progression over time. Look at what happened earlier in the week when there was a rumor that Amazon was going to start accepting Bitcoin for goods. Bitcoin shot clear up. Now, Amazon said there are no immediate plans to introduce their own cryptocurrency or accept Bitcoin. Very nuanced because they hired the people they would need. There was public hiring posts to hire the people they would need to implement that system. But they're not doing, we are not imminently doing this. We're not doing it. They didn't say yet. They said now. We're not doing it now. We're, we are not working on this right now. This is not a plan right now but they're putting the pieces of the puzzle, they're buying the infrastructure, if you will, to make it happen later. Because if crypto becomes something that people want to exchange in, you better believe that Amazon wants to be the place where it's getting exchanged. They're not gonna risk missing out on that. Just a matter of time, guys, just a matter of time. So, with that said, um, now, We've got, what, a 6% increase in the uh, mining capacity of the Bitcoin network, the processing capacity, on top of a 2% increase before that. Um, so that's 6 plus 2 is 8. We were down 60. We're back up 8. What do you think is going to happen when we're back even again or at an all-time high for processing capability? Yeah, it's going to go up more. It's not too late, guys. It's still not too late to jump in on the crypto train. All right, let me check this here. Need a flashing red light. Are you going to run for half an hour? Or are you going to run till 9.30? I'm going to run till I'm done talking or until my wife needs to go to the hospital. So that's those are the two things. Not because she, <laughs> I'm going to talk until my wife dies. No, not like that. Um, her father's in the hospital. He's still fighting. So thank you very much for the prayers, guys. Uh, Brian is, uh, you know, it's one of those uh, one step forward, two step back kind of things. Um, but he's still fighting. And that's a lot, a lot of people after a heart attack this severe, you know, two weeks into the hospital, two and, two and a half weeks into the hospital would not be fighting like this. Um, but he's fighting. And so I appreciate the prayers. They're making a huge difference. Right, Bill found me. Yeah, it took you long enough, Bill. I don't know what, what took you so long to get here. All righty. Thor must have been saving the Mondayest, having the Mondayest of Sundays. Yeah, you know, it could happen like that. All right, coffee in Schrockville. At least when mining Bitcoin, you can't get trapped two miles underground if something catastrophic happens. This is true, but we did have a lightning bolt explosion in the mine the other day that took out a mining unit. That that hurts. No, I mean, I didn't get shocked. It hurts because those units cost $7,000 a piece, and when one blows up like that, 
<laughs> it's hard to get them fixed right now. Question about stacking Bitcoin or staking staking Bitcoin. I have a BlockFi account and I'm earning interest. Is that the same as staking the Bitcoin? Okay, great question, Charlie. Okay, staking is purely an Ethereum thing. There is no staking if it's not Ethereum. And there is no staking of Ethereum right now, really. I mean, there is, but you don't want to do it just yet. Here's why. So when you stake your Ethereum, you're locking that coin in on the ETH2 blockchain. It can't be moved until the full blockchain merges over. So what they're doing right now is they have, a, a, in English, there's a bunch of people mining Ethereum with hardware, proof of work. They don't want to pull the rug out from under those guys. So what they're trying to do is slowly lower the rewards for the proof of work while they slowly increase the awards for staking so that these guys have time to get return on investment on the hardware they bought. They can sell the hardware to the next fool in line. They can get out and then they can take the Ethereum that they've been saving and not exchanging on exchanges because they want to stake it and then stake it. So that's what's going to happen. Um, if you stake it now on the Ethereum 2 chain, you will get paid stake interest, basically. Um, but you get paid interest on BlockFi without staking it. So if you, if you put your crypto on BlockFi, it's earning interest as a, on a deposit account in the same fractional reserve banking that a bank would use. Um, you're, you're giving your crypto the keys to your crypto to BlockFi, so there's a lot of trust there. If BlockFi fails, you've lost all your crypto. It's just gone. But in return for that, BlockFi is lending, is using that crypto to lend out to other people and using it to collateralize and do other things. And it's reducing its risk profile by making sure the people that it lends money to are also collateralized with their own crypto. So that if they default on the loan, they can take their crypto to pay you back. So it's actually a pretty slick system. It's a pretty, pretty scary system for the banking industry, though, which is why, of course, stable coins need to be regulated and interest-bearing crypto accounts need to be regulated as well because we simply cannot have a 7.5% interest rate account competing against the dollar. We can't have it. So there you go. That's what the government says anyway. Okay. Yeah, there's. they got to keep the speakers up a little bit to hear what's going on on the radio station. Okay. All right, so uh, the other thing I was going to talk about here today is the new data recovery tools coming into the lab over at Schrock. One of the things about uh, solid state hard drives is obviously they have no mechanical parts, they don't have moving parts. And so when they fail, the failures tend to be a lot more sudden than what you would see in a mechanical drive. So the first symptom of a solid state failure is a reduction in capacity. You go from 120 gig solid state to 116 gigs. And if you don't notice that, because we all are always looking at the available capacity of our C drive to see if it maybe has dropped for some inexplicable reason, which it shouldn't, but if it did, that would be a sign of a problem, wouldn't it? Have you checked to see if your processor slowed down too? You know, I mean, why not? So that's what Drive Advisor does for solid state drives. It watches for those capacity drops, and that's how it, me it measures the health of your solid state based on wear and tear. So there comes a point when you've used the solid state cells so many times, the solid state reports that I, if I'm not failing already, I should be failing soon. And then we reflect that in the health percentage. Otherwise, if we see a drop in the capacity, that means you've lost memory chips on the drive or firmware is growing corrupt. And that's an indication of failure as well. It's important to have Drive Advisor running on your computers with solid state drives. But for those of you who don't, and other customers who don't know about Schrock, their solid states just seem to up and fail overnight. And then they bring them into Schrock for data recovery. We have lots of tools for mechanical drives, but we only have a small number of tools for solid states. And we're changing that right now because 70% of our customers now have solid state drives, and we need to have that capability to recover different brands of solid states because the recovery is different for every drive. Uh, so we're making a huge investment. The data recovery tools are incredibly expensive. Uh, we're buying the Pre-C3000 SSD from Ace Labs. Um, that right there, each module is four thousand dollars. So the machine itself is four grand. The SSD module is four grand. The firmware module is four grand. The network module is four grand. The cloning module is four grand. I, it's amazing their pricing. I don't know who comes up with the numbers, but it's almost like they're just running a Xerox, you know, and just four grand, four grand, four grand, four grand. That's just the system that allows us to image and clone and recover the solid state drive. 
Um, so when you when you go to a place like Drive Savers, for example, to have your data recovery done, and they come back and they charge you, you know, twenty six hundred dollars to recover your solid state or four thousand dollars to recover your solid state, it's because they're recouping the investment on all their new equipment. Now, yes, the equipment is expensive, but Schrock plans to make that money back over a long period of time by maintaining relationships with people. We do, unfortunately, have repeat data recovery customers because we charge as little as $400 for a data recovery. That's our entry price for the lab. The entry price at Drive Savers is $1,300. If it's under that, they don't do it. So at $400, if we can put it on a machine and image it and let it go, We've had one drive imaging in our data recovery lab for over a year because we that one I think we quoted 800 bucks on uh, and it was running nice and fast and then all of a sudden it slowed down and we did everything we could to speed it up again. It, it literally is hanging on by a thread and we're at that point where we are getting data and we're getting data at a reliable rate that's good data. Therefore, don't touch it because if one more thing goes wrong, we're not going to get any data. So literally, we're getting the data at the speed of like that probe that passed Pluto a while ago, <laughs> sending information back to Earth. We're getting data like that fast. It's really slow, really like a kilobyte per second slow on a, on a 300 gig hard drive. It's going to take a long time, but that's why it's been going for a year. But we stand behind what we quote. We've literally had one imaging machine, the 4,000, 4,000, 4,000, 4,000, 4,000 machine. One of those dedicated to this guy's drive for a year because we quoted him a price and we stand behind what we quote. So if that's the kind of service that you're looking for in data recovery, when the time comes, like I said, data recovery is like a plumbing service or an elect electrician. You don't need it until you need it. And then when you need it, you need it bad. When or if that moment ever happens to you or someone you know that needs it, please think of Schrock. Um, it helps us recoup the value of our equipment. It helps us introduce our products and services to new customers, and it helps us to, to build new relationships. And I really appreciate the referrals. Also, be sure if you haven't done so already, you've entered the contest at schrockinnovations.com to win a free laptop. Um, that contest is going to go on uh, short. It's going to go through the end of August into September by maybe a week um, because what we're going to do is the Best of Lincoln launches on the 15th. So right now you can go enter, you can vote in the Best of Omaha. There are other actions that you can do to earn additional entries in the contest. When the 15th comes and the Best of Lincoln voting is open, we're going to add that as an extra entry option in the contest. So then you can come back and you can get even more entries by just voting for us in another Best of competition. So it works out great. Uh, Best of Lincoln, we're always for years, we've been the number one independent computer repair company. Uh, we qualify it as independent because Best Buy always takes number one, like overall number one, just because of name recognition. Everybody knows what Best Buy is. Where do you go for computers, Best Buy? We, you know, right? So coming in number two to Best Buy, we want, we really want, I want to overtake them this year. So I could, I would really appreciate it on the 15th when that time rolls. If you haven't done so already, go vote for us in the Best of Omaha. Get entered in the contest because then you're all logged in and everything is set up. When the 15th comes around, you just go back to that page. You click on the thing again, and boom, you can vote in the Best of Lincoln. And it's, there is an option for you. Uh, it's bestoflincoln.net. It's not up yet, but it will be. And then you'll be able to vote for Schrock Innovations for the best computer repair in Lincoln as well. And I'd appreciate it if you could do that. It means a lot to us. All right, last call for questions before I wrap up my, uh, my how long has this one been here? Where, uh, where's my clock? 34 minutes in, so I'm actually, I'm actually an hour in. But 34 minutes in for, for the rest of you watching right now. So let's call for those questions now to see if there's anything else that anybody wants to talk about here. Aaron says, I refuse to, to let Best Buy touch my computers. You know, it's uh, Best Buy actually has some decent techs. We try to hire some of them from time to time. Um, but the problem that Best Buy has with on the repair side is that they're not allowed to do anything. So they're boxed into solutions. Now, how is that different than what Schrock does for its technicians? Like we tell our technicians, you will offer Sophos. We don't care what your opinion is on any other piece of software. You might personally not run Sophos, although you get a free copy if you work here. You may personally not run it, but you're not going to recommend Avast or AVG or McAfee or Norton, Norton 360 because we can give you demonstrable reasons why those products are not sufficient for our customers. We put our customers on Sophos. If they don't want Sophos, 
they can't afford Sophos, um, they don't believe that Sophos is good, we don't have a back sell or a down sell into something else. There is nothing else that protects like Sophos. So you either have that protection or you don't. Now, having some protection is better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick, but we're not going to install it and manage it for you because I don't want to be responsible when you get both eyes poked out with a sharp stick because you know that's what would happen. Well, you installed this crap for me. Why would you do that if you knew I was going to get infected? Because you told me to. That doesn't work. doesn't work. Don't want to be responsible. Don't want to touch it. So, you know, it's one of those things. So Best Buy, you know, they sell... Um, oh, what is that stuff? Oh, gosh. The Mart has the total IT stuff. I saw another computer shop in Bellevue now has their own antivirus, which is like always, oh, God. Did you build an antivirus yourselves? I know, th I know these people. They don't have an, in an in-house. They don't have the in-house programming staff that Schrock does. And I've got 250000 a year in payroll invested in three people, four people, that make all of Schrock's tech products work. And we wouldn't try to make our own antivirus. It's not smart. We don't have the research staff for it. We don't have the, the threat analysis capability. We don't have the AI capability. We don't have the tools in the toolbox to keep our people safe if we did it ourselves. So we don't. So the other thing is they could be buying a white box antivirus, somebody who makes one and then sells it under different brands to different customers. Um, again, usually that's made by a third party company that doesn't have the same analytic capabilities as a Sophos does or a Semantic does. Um, yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but uh, gosh, what is the one? I want, it's not total IT that Best Buy sells. Somebody help me out here. What does Best Buy sell when you try to buy a computer in there? It's not McAfee. It's not Norton 360. It's their own. Um, oh, I can't think of it. Anyway, uh, Computer Associates. That's what it is. Computer Associates. CA. They try to sell you CA. Um, so anyway, um, their people are told to sell that. Um, their people are told that, you know, here are the computer lineups and, you know, these are the cards and you can compare them and, you know, if one of the guys happens to know which computer is better, he'll tell the customer that, but otherwise it's which one do you think looks prettiest. Um, they have, you will sell the warranties and this is just you know, what you, you will sell the Geek Squad protection plan, you know, and this is what it does. So every shop has that stuff. Like when we sell a computer, you will offer a data transfer. You will recommend that because otherwise customers end up not having their stuff, they recycle their old computer and it's a nightmare. Uh, or they think they have everything and then they don't, and that's a nightmare. Number two, you will offer antivirus because by offering antivirus, we're either going to say, oh, I have it on my other computer already. Then we're going to say, is there other programs as part of the data transfer you'd like me to install for you? That's the only time we'll install something else that not our antivirus because it's part of a data transfer. It's something you had running on the old computer that you want to run on the new computer. And our objective when we sell you a new computer is to make that computer work as much like your old computer as it did before to minimize your transition into the new system. So if you really want to run Norton 360 because it protects 14 devices on your network and you think you're getting a great value having crappy protection on all 14 devices as opposed to good protection on the ones that really need it, hey, this is your rodeo. We'll do it as part of the data transfer. You have to provide us with the license and you're responsible for it, but we'll do that as part of the data transfer so that your computer is protected exactly the same as it was before now. Of course, we're going to recommend Sophos and Secure Updater and Drive Advisor but we're not going to force you to do it. So anyway, the uh, you know every shop's got their own stuff that they push. You know they they do. Uh, Shrock's no different in that regard. But the thing that's different about our stuff is our technicians can tell you with precise rationale, actual factual reasons why what we're telling you to do makes sense, as opposed to what other people are telling you to do. Norton 360 has no AI component. Sophos does. You know, it's all the difference in the world. Avast will not keep you safe from ransomware. Sophos will. All the difference in the world. Um, installing patches. Yes, you can install your own patches. Do you know that there's over 12 per week you're supposed to be installing on the computer that are not Microsoft related? 
And then what's your turn time on that? How fast are you getting them installed? Is it two weeks, three weeks per patch? Is there another patch by the time you install the first patch? That's why we created Secure Updater that does it every eight hours. We recommend it. Drive Advisor. Are there other hard drive monitoring utilities? Yes, there's Crystal Disk. There's a Hard Drive Sentinel. Uh, there are other ones that you can buy and pay for, but Drive Advisor uses the same health algorithm as other programs do, and it's free. Why not? <laughs> you know, it's free, and it sends you an email. And if you're a Schrock customer, so if you're buying a Schrock computer, we've got that computer tagged with a number, and that number is associated with your Drive Advisor subscription. It's a free subscription, but it's still a subscription, right? And that way, when your hard drive starts to fail, um, like I had a situation, I don't know if I deleted them already. Let me see if anybody failed during the radio show here. Nope, nobody during the show. And the ones that failed yesterday, I, we had like three C drives report failure yesterday through Drive Advisor. Each one of those customers got a phone call. An actual human being from Schrock. Yes, they got an email, probably went to a Gmail account, probably got sorted into promotions, probably never got seen. But a human being from our service center took the time, because you're a Schrock customer, to pick up the phone and call you and tell you your C drive is failing. Furthermore, your computer is under warranty still. Therefore, if you bring it into us, we will fix it for free. But please turn it off right now. Don't try to back anything up. Please don't let us do that for you. Because you, sometimes you only get one try before the whole thing falls apart. And we want to make sure that we're doing that try so it falls apart on the bench where we can control the pieces, you see? So please just power it down, bring it into us, 24 hour, 48 hour turnaround, worst case scenario, we'll get the computer back to you with the data on it if we can get it transferred off the drive. At no cost to you, it's part of the warranty. That's not part of the warranty at Best Buy. At Best Buy, the warranty is we put a new hard drive in, we run the factory restore, you have your original computer back with no data. That's all we're guaranteeing is that we, you have a computer that runs. Your data is your responsibility. At Schrock, yes, your data is still your responsibility, but if you hand us a drive with your data, heck yeah, we're going to restore it. Or if we have the ability to clone your drive rather than just put a new one in and install Windows Clean on it, and it takes less time actually for our technicians to clone it than to redo all the work, why on earth would we not do the solution that's better for everybody? Every, and what, if it goes sideways, we've got a clone of the drive. We have another copy of the data, or at least part of it. If it was going to go that badly sideways, you'd have been in data recovery anyway. Gee, I wonder if we have a data recovery lab that could evaluate the drive for us. Oh, yeah, huh, we do. 24-hour turnaround. Yay, love that. So it's pretty fun stuff. It's pretty fun stuff having the talent that we have around and the professionals like Brian and Alfonso and Parker and Trenton and Gabe. Golly, I don't want to forget anybody. Kane, Eli, um, Cor uh, Corby. Man, that dude is getting rave reviews in the Papillion Service Center. We're like, put that guy up front in front of every customer that comes in the door because everybody loves Corby. We could have a TV show called Everybody Loves Corby, and it, it would be a hit. It's amazing. So uh, anyway, I want to, uh, what do you mean to clone the drive? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't use technical terms without an explanation, huh? Uh, cloning a hard drive. So um, I have a hard drive here. It has all of your information in it. And then over here, I have a blank hard drive that has no information in it. I hook both of them up to a computer, and sector by sector, I copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste, every file, every sector, the entire drive. Then I take this drive that is stable. Your drive, you see, wasn't stable. It was dying. But because Drive Advisor caught it early, it worked well enough that we could get all the information onto a stable drive. This is a, they're literally copies of each other. And I can take this drive and stick it in your computer and it boots off of it just like it was the first drive. It doesn't know the difference. And your computer is back up and running again like magic. And that's what cloning the hard drive means. So whether you have a Schrock computer or a regular computer, the first choice is always, can we clone the drive? Because if we can clone the drive, if you have a hard drive that goes from 100% health to 99% health, that's the computer equivalent of a heart attack. Dropping down below that into the 50 percentile, like 55-ish, things get a little dicey. 40 and 30%, pretty likely we're not going to get a clone. Below that, we're terrified to try to clone it 
rather than send it to Brian in the data recovery lab because we can kill the drive and take you from what would be a $400 data recovery up to a $1,200 data recovery like that. So we're not so sure we should even try. We should just send it to Brian and let Brian do it for 400 And we will call you and give you these options. We'll say, okay, here's the deal. Your drive went from 100% to 80% to 30% before you brought it in. We called you every single time it dropped. And every time you said, oh, yeah, I keep meaning to bring it in, but you kept using the computer even though we told you not to. Now, of course, we won't say it like that. We won't say anything like that. That's what we're thinking, though. So now the drive is at 30%. What do we do with it at 30%? We can't attempt to clone the drive. If I attempt to clone the drive, the odds of a clone are roughly 50-50 being successful. And the drive could, probably will, degrade more from all the activity of cloning it. If it degrades further, it could fail completely, requiring a data recovery lab intervention. If the data recovery lab intervention requires more than a simple advanced clone, where we literally, if we, we go sector by sector in the data recovery lab, just like we do in the shop, but the equipment in the lab, if it hits a sector it can't get, it skips that sector and goes on. So it, it basically gets all the cripples first, all the easy ones first, then it goes in and tries to get a little bit harder on all these other sectors, and it gets some of them. Then it goes backwards and forwards and sideways, left, right, and it scans and it scans and it does different timeouts and it waits longer for each read until it gets every sector it can get. And then we have a clone. So that's the process. That's the easy data recovery. That's the $400 data recovery. And right now at 30%, you're in that $400 data recovery territory. If we have a failure that requires us to simulate firmware or do any of the more exotic things that this new equipment's going to let us do with solid state drives. Now we're okay, if firmware repair is 800 bucks on top of the 400, now you're at 1200. So we can try, but if it goes sideways, it's going to cost you up to $1200 to fix. Or we can go the safer route, do $400 and get the data. Pretty much guaranteed. And we'll give you the choice. We'll let you choose. You know, you want to snake eyes. You know, uh, how lucky are you? Do you feel lucky, punk? Uh, and then we'll do what we need to do, whatever you tell us to do moving forward. So that's what cloning the drive means. Uh, do you work on Apple MacBooks? Oh, yeah, all the time. Uh, all the time, especially uh, Mac Minis, iMacs, MacBooks, MacBook Pros, all of them. Um, the limitations on your MacBooks, the more modern ones, the storage is actually built into the logic board, the main board of the laptop. It can't be accessed. If that fails, you're just out of luck. It can't be removed. If the motherboard fails, you're out of luck. Uh, it is incredibly important if you have a Mac, especially a Mac with integrated data, like a MacBook or a MacBook Pro, that you have an external copy of your hard drive at all times. Um, you can't boot from it anymore. The new Mac M1s won't allow you to boot from external media anymore. But having a backup of the files is incredibly important. You can get it on iCloud. You can do whatever you want to do. You can use Carbonite. But there isn't much you can do for a MacBook once the motherboard fails or the memory chips fail on that onboard drive. That's the problem with built-in devices like that. You're getting <clears throat> a really powerful, fast device from Apple. All the components are discrete. They're all built onto the same board. If any one part fails, if your, if your Ethernet port fails or your Wi-Fi fails, it's not replaceable, and you have to buy a whole new MacBook. Whereas with a PC, you still have replaceable components. So some small differences there. But yeah, we work on them. All right, guys, got to wrap it up. Now it's been 49 minutes, so I've done almost an hour and a half now. I feel like I've given you a good value. I hope so. I hope you feel the same way. Um, if you have questions, you can obviously shoot them in. I'm not in the service center as much the last couple of weeks just because I've been helping out with the family situation. Um, Lord willing, Brian stays off the vent, and uh, we're able to, uh, to get him to a place where he can have his LVAD implanted and then move toward a transplant eventually. That's the, that's the long-term plan. Uh, so uh, hopefully we can get there, and hopefully that happens. And when it does happen, it's going to happen quick. So hopefully we, uh, your prayers are very much appreciated for a quiet, nice, stable Sunday and Monday so that we can have some options for him on maybe Tuesday to, uh, to make some life-changing decisions. So I appreciate the time that you guys have taken to include us in your prayers and on your prayer list at church. It means a lot to the family, the lovely Kimberly, and I very, very much appreciate that. 
Um, but yeah, but I promise you, I will make up the time in the service centers. I still pop my head in. I still make sure I'm getting things ordered. I'm on top of those laptops because we got to be uh, making sure that every every day that we can order anything, we get it on order so that it's coming to us so it'll be ready for you when the time comes. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch today. Please remember to vote for us. Uh, register to win that free laptop, schrockinnovations.com. Just click on the big graphic there on the top of the page. Uh, and then you can vote in the best of Omaha, eventually vote in the best of Lincoln. You can post reviews. You can take a picture of yourself in a Schrock location, doing something stupid if you want. I don't care. Uh, it sends us the picture. And then we can, uh, we can use those photos on our social media. So if you don't have social media, that's one way that you can, uh, you can participate and get some extra entries without having to expose yourself to the socials. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great afternoon and the great rest of the weekend.